experienced panelists who will provide us with insightful perspectives. Their many accomplishments are described in the program booklets. And you'll be able to ask questions after all three have spoken. In his books, Media Control and Manufacturing Consent, Noam Chomsky examines the immense influence of the mass media and states that his purpose is, quote, to defend the economic, social, and political agenda of privileged groups that dominate the domestic society and the state. Likewise, in the media monopoly, journalist and media critic Ben Badikyan writes that there is no greater force than the mass media in shaping the public mind. To control information, he says, is to control the public. In the book's first edition in 1983, Badikyan warned that with increasing media consolidation, only 50 corporations owned all the newspapers, magazines, radio and television stations, book publishers, and movie studios that provide our news and entertainment. Today, those 50 corporations have merged into five or six. These media conglomerates have vast financial interests to protect that overlap with other industries. In a phenomenon called corporate interlocks, one finds that the very same people who sit on the boards of the media companies are also directors of oil companies, big banks, defense contractors, or pharmaceutical giants. Lockheed Martin, Citigroup, and Chevron, for example, have shared directors with the Washington Post, Time Warner, and NBC News. Interlocking creates an enormous conflict of interest when reporting on issues such as war, Wall Street fraud, or climate change. But Dikian explains, quote, when their most sensitive economic interests are at stake, the parent corporations seldom refrain from using their power over public information. This becomes particularly relevant for Armenians when we look at American economic interests in Turkey. The American Turkish Council, or ATC, brings together some of the largest corporations in the United States and Turkey to encourage trade and investment between the two countries and to strengthen their strategic alliance. At the ATC's highest membership levels and on its board, one finds many of the same companies, Boeing, Chevron, Citigroup, General Electric, that are interlocked with the mainstream media. This reality explains why the corporate media regularly frame the Armenian genocide as a controversy rather than a fact, and why Turkey, as well as Azerbaijan, succeeds in disseminating false narratives. Professor Levon Chalajan will explore how, the, how media coverage of the genocide changed from international outrage to a debatable semi-fact with sides. He will talk about the impact of Turkey's joining NATO in the early 1950s, the advent of global media monopolies, and how these factors present obstacles to accurate coverage of Armenian issues. Carla Garabetian, a filmmaker and journalist, will speak on the ways in which mainstream media frame the Armenian genocide, explaining how the he said, she said model of American journalism results in Turkish denial being given equal weight to historical fact. She will also analyze how historical foreign policy and political considerations influence coverage. Finally, journalist Adis Nalji has traveled from Turkey to discuss how the Turkish media cover Armenian affairs, sometimes framing reporting within the larger context of freedom of speech and human rights. He will also address how certain Turkish media engage in hate speech against minorities, especially Armenians, and the effect this has on Turkish society. Uh, I'd like to uh, uh, start by talking about the uh, organization and structure of the American media. Media, one of America's uh, foremost post World War II liberals, uh, Ben Bogdan, uh, who had a distinguished career as a journalist, 
uh, newspaper man, editor at the Washington Post, and dean of the uh, UC Berkeley uh, Journalism School. Uh, but Bob Deacon also wrote books. Uh, he published six books. Uh, his first one came out in 1964. It was called In the Midst of Plenty. It was a short little volume based on his travels uh, off of uh, interstates and state and county roads and then down dirt roads uh, looking for uh, poor families in different parts of America. And he provided uh, very moving and sympathetic portraits of those families. And while uh, his book uh, wasn't as well known as Michael Harrington's The Other America, I think that the Bogdikin's efforts have helped to uh, educate Americans about poverty in this country and uh, help to set the groundwork for Johnson's uh, Great Society programs. Uh, in the mid-70s, uh, he published a book on the U.S. prison system called Caged, Eight Prisoners and Their Keepers. Uh, based on interviews that he did in the federal prison system. This was just on the cusp of the uh, advent of the uh, uh, war on drugs that um, uh, is largely responsible for the tremendous expansion in the number of inmates in this country uh, from roughly 700,000 in the mid-70s uh, to uh, close to 2.5 million uh, today. Uh, his most famous book, though, is the, uh, is the one that was mentioned in the introduction, The Media Monopoly. Uh, that came out in 1983. It's been through uh, six or seven different editions. And then there was a major revised edition that came out in the early uh, 2000s called uh, The New Media Monopoly. And it was a very influential book. I think that along with Chomsky and Herman's The Manufacturing Consent, uh, these, these are the two uh, uh, books that talk about the very disturbing trends in the US mass media. Uh, that have to do with uh, mergers and consolidations. And uh, yes, uh, Bob Deacon pinpointed 50 uh, corporations that he said dominated uh, the US mass media uh, in the early 1980s. Uh, the ones that are left, uh, I have written down here, Viacom, uh, Murdoch's News Corp, uh, Bertelsmann, the Vendee Universal, Sony, AOL, Time Warner, uh, and Disney. Um, Baudicchio's vision of, uh, of a, a media in service of the public interest, uh, in some ways it was, it was a nostalgic one. He, he looked back to a time when not only large cities, but medium-sized and even the smallest cities had multiple competing uh, daily newspapers. And that's a world that um, uh, is long gone. There are only a couple of uh, cities in the United States that have more than one uh, daily. Boston is one of them. Uh, but um, uh, he also uh, uh, looked upon uh, local uh, family-owned newspapers as uh, being the backbone of a free press. And um, that, was, uh, that was something that meant a lot to him, and he, he talked about it at length in his books. But uh, I always question that, because I, I've been working uh, in Lowell uh, for decades now, and the dominant newspaper there uh, is the Lowell Sun, uh, which it was until recently a family-owned and operated newspaper, and it was an extremely <coughs> conservative newspaper. Uh, over the years, it uh, opposed every proposal for increased minimum wages that was put forth. It defended Richard Nixon up until the day he resigned and after. It was a staunch defender of the Vietnam War. Locally, it uh, opposed rent control. Uh, there was nothing uh, progressive about it, but structurally, in terms of ownership, it fit Bob Deacon's model of what a, what a good newspaper ought to be, uh, but not in terms of, uh, of what it published uh, ever. Um, Herman and Chomsky uh, published a Manufacturing Consent in 1988. They covered some of the same ground that uh, Bob Deacon covers, but uh, from a, a little bit uh, different kind of perspective. Uh, in that book, um, they, they deal mostly, it's a lengthy book, it's a, uh, they deal mostly with um, uh, U.S. coverage of the Vietnam War and the uh, events in Cambodia versus coverage of uh, mass murder in Indonesia at the same, uh, roughly around the same time. Uh, and what they point out is that uh, the U.S. media coverage was uh, uh, heavily uh, anti-communist uh, in its uh, coverage of Cambodia and Vietnam, uh, and it provided very little uh, information or insight 
uh, into uh, mass murders in uh, Indonesia that claimed uh, hundreds of thousands, possibly a million lives, uh, after Kissinger uh, gave the green light uh, to the uh, Indonesian government to uh, go ahead uh, with their agenda. Uh, but that was uh, that was mass killing endorsed by Washington, and uh, the media in situations like that uh, typically reports for duty and uh, does its job. Uh, Herman and Chomsky in their book talk about five filters, which I think are important uh, uh, in helping us to understand how the media operates. Uh, they are uh, structure, uh, advertising, sourcing, flak, and anti-communism. Uh, which now is replaced by, uh, by anti-terrorism. Uh, by size and structure, uh, they refer to the fact that the mass media are uh, big businesses, uh, in business uh, primarily uh, to make money, uh, and that uh, they share, as a result, the same kinds of interests as other major corporations. Uh, they share an interest in uh, low taxes. They share an interest in uh, rapid write-offs on the capital investments. They share an in interest in replacing skilled workers with uh, new uh, automated technologies. And uh, they are part of uh, what we can call uh, a capitalist business establishment. And uh, they, this is reflected in their reporting. Uh, we're supposed to believe that, that this has no effect on the nature of uh, what they deem to be worthwhile stories or how they cover stories, but there's a lot of evidence to indicate that uh, these are very powerful forces that do have an effect. Uh, there's also the fact that uh, the uh, newspaper industry, uh, and to a greater extent the television industry, is dependent on advertising for its survival. Most of the uh, revenue of newspapers does not come from subscriptions, it comes from ads. And advertisers uh, can intervene uh, and do intervene uh, in areas where they don't like the kinds of st stories that are being covered and the type of coverage that is being given to them. A very important element, as far as we're concerned, is what they call sourcing. Uh, sourcing refers to where do, uh, where do news workers get the information uh, to uh, write their stories and produce their programs. And the answer to that is uh, they primarily rely on official sources. So uh, if there's a, some kind of uh, international issue going on, uh, the White House, uh, the State Department, uh, the Department of Defense are the first places that they would go to. If you have a, a, a dissident or non-conforming opinion, uh, you're not on their regular route of where they go to get information and uh, you have to work uh, to get their attention and convince them uh, that uh, what you uh, want reported and the way you want reported, the uh, way you want it reported matter. Um, then there's flack uh, and the fact that uh, there are people who are out there and organizations that are out there who will uh, uh, contest uh, your position and what you have to say. And this is something that uh, we constantly have to deal with on Armenian uh, genocide issues, uh, whether it's the Turkish embassy or uh, various uh, lobbying organizations, uh, they are out there and they will uh, they will intervene. Um, and uh, then uh, anti-communism. But uh, there are uh, very powerful obstacles uh, to get getting the Armenian genocide story out. At the time that the genocide was happening, uh, there was no controversy at all. Uh, and even though the, uh, the Ottoman state attempted to uh, uh, carry out its uh, genocidal program as much as possible, uh, secretly even using coded uh, telegrams that um, uh, would give the impression that uh, something different was going on than what was actually going on, uh, the news did get out. Uh, Ambassador Morgenthau's book, of course, is a very important example of the news getting out. There were also missionary reports and consular reports and whatnot. There were journalists uh, who were uh, on the scene, and uh, the story got out, and it was not a contested story. Uh, but uh, genocide denial uh, did start very early on, and uh, the, the example here is that the Russians, the uh, British, and the French uh, wrote a protest letter uh, in May of 1915 uh, to the Ottoman government. 
and the court responded with a lengthy denial that uh, is a prototypical denial. It contains all of the benchmarks of denial that have come down uh, to us today. Uh, Armenian treason, uh, Armenian disloyalty, uh, moving people out of um, uh, contested border areas and war zones, uh, taking uh, care to make sure uh, that their lives and property uh, were protected. Uh, and then uh, also uh, national security arguments that the Ottoman state uh, was in a, in a period of war. Uh, the war in 1915 was not going very well, uh, and therefore they had, the, they had the right of all sovereign nations uh, to protect their interests. Uh, these arguments are uh, still around today, uh, decades later. Um, uh, Turkey, um, the Republic of Turkey that was founded uh, in 1923 uh, as a successor state to the Ottoman Empire uh, has also, of course, uh, been very active uh, in denial efforts, and they have not hesitated to, um, uh, to uh, engage in denial here in the United States. Uh, a retired uh, U.S. Admiral uh, Colby Chester, for example, published an uh, article uh, in Current History in 1922 or 1923, uh, in which uh, he uh, denied the genocide and uh, said that the reports of killings of Armenians were due to intense levels of anti-Islamic bias in the American mass media, and that these uh, stories were uh, tremendously uh, fabricated. Um, and current history, uh, which was a, a, an important source of information on international affairs at the time, uh, published it. Uh, there's also the uh, Musadab case uh, in the 1930s where uh, the Turkish state intervened uh, with the State Department to, um, to uh, uh, kill the MGM's plan to make a blockbuster film out of the 40 days of Musadab. This is written about uh, by uh, Edward Minasian uh, in a book called uh, Musadab. And uh, when you read that book, uh, what was striking to me was the uh, the willingness of the U.S. State Department to uh, cater uh, to Turkish government demands on this film and their willingness to intercede uh, with MGM and make sure that the project uh, was killed. And uh, there were uh, attempts uh, in the 50s and also the 60s uh, to revive this film project, and Turkey also intervened on those occasions. And the U.S. State Department, again, was very willing uh, to uh, help the Turks out on that. Uh, I actually had to bring this quote uh, in the, in the Musadab book from a State Department official named Richards uh, in 1952 on the Musadab film project. Uh, I, can, I can recount it to you. He says that uh, he hopes that the day never comes that uh, the four days of Musadab will be produced as a, uh, as a play or a movie. Uh, because uh, the Turkish government is very sensitive about uh, this uh, period in their history, and as a valued ally, we have to uh, assist them in whatever way we can. Uh, this is right around the time that um, uh, Turkey joined NATO. Uh, in fact, uh, Turkey came into the U.S. foreign policy orbit with the Truman Doctrine in 1947, when both Greece and Turkey uh, became recipients of uh, U.S. Uh, economic uh, and military aid. Uh, the Turks then joined the, uh, the uh, what's officially called the police action, what we know as the Korean War, uh, and uh, their reward was in 1952 they were admitted to NATO, which I maintain uh, has been a disaster uh, for the Armenian commu uh, community and, uh, and its agenda. Uh, and I remember my mother, I mean, she used to say, uh, you know, she loved the Franklin D. Roosevelt and she hated Harry Truman. And she hated Harry Truman because she said, he's taking all our tax money and giving it to those damn Turks. Uh, and uh, I don't know about taking all of it, but he was giving it some, some of it to the Turks. And the total amount of money that the Turks have received uh, from the, um, from the uh, U.S. government uh, exceeds now $11 million. Uh, in uh, military and, um, and economic aid. Much of it is U.S. taxpayer money. Um, and we have also uh, trained over uh, 20,000 uh, Turkish military personnel. 
so uh, what, has, what this has done is it has uh, created the linkages uh, at the highest levels of state down to interpersonal relations between Turks uh, and Armenians. And uh, some Turks can be very persuasive on the Armenian genocide issue. I mean, their, their entire school system and mass media system that Paris, I think, is going to talk about and bring it forward uh, to that presentation and Carlos as well. Uh, but, uh, you know, they, they grew up in a, in a structural system that um, uh, tells them the official history of the Republic of Turkey. And the way that goes is that uh, Turkey was uh, occupied by Allied forces. Uh, Ataturk uh, organized and led a courageous independence movement and uh, threw out these uh, imperialist powers and uh, also uh, brought the uh, disloyal minorities to heel. And um, so Turkey is a, is a great success, uh, growing Phoenix like out of the ashes of its defeat in World War I. And that's the curriculum, curriculum in the school system, that's the curriculum in the mass media. So Turks can be very persuasive uh, uh, genocide deniers, and they need lots of Americans because of changing, uh, changing um, uh, immigration patterns, and changing uh, alliances between countries, uh, business investments in Turkey, uh, and so on. So I think we have a very uh, difficult uh, road to hoe. Uh, I don't think uh, it's impossible, but uh, we need to mobilize resources. We need to have greater resources than what we have now. And we have to see uh, Turkish denial uh, as a real threat uh, to the history of our people. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm speaking to you today as somebody who's been a member of media. I'm, I'm, I've worn the habit of being a news anchor and a producer of both news and documentaries. Um, actually, the first film I made, I was 11 years old, it was called Mission, What is the News? <laughs> and I decided that I, my first documentary should be, how do we understand the news? Why I got this into my head, I don't know, but it seems to have become a theme. Um, the, my doctorate was about the whole idea of British spin on the issue of um, nuclear politics, which at the time that I was doing my research was a big deal in Europe. And uh, I was very uh, interested in the whole notion of what sets the agenda, what drives the narrative. We've now heard that phrase, optics, what optics are used. Um, and sp specifically in the reporting of foreign policy, it's a complex mix of economic, political, and organizational influences which shape how the media covers any one particular news issue. And when it comes to how the Armenian genocide has been reported in the mainstream media, I argue that we Armenians have been obsessed with one equation, and that equation is, we believe more reporting, more reporting leads to justice. So, we've waited for that big hit of media coverage, newspaper articles, TV stories that would flood the national debate, forcing the issue onto the world stage, and when that happens, we thought, finally, there will be change. Through the glare of publicity, our cause will be addressed. Finally, we'll see justice. Lots of media coverage, justice. That's the wrong model. And it's a reasonable expectation. After all, we've only seen recently how one elevator video has changed the debate on domestic violence in the United States with such force, some of us wonder why we didn't know about this issue before. But while the volume of media coverage can change on a dime, we also know that media coverage can be unpredictable because I would argue that we've had three main periods of coverage. The first wave, as you heard, was during the genocide itself. And we had, relatively speaking, masses of newspaper coverage, not just in one publication, but in not just one country, but in several countries between 1915 and 1923. And it's true we didn't have moving picture, but we did have photographs that were published. We had eyewitness reports that were published. We had diplomatic sources quoted. We had telegrams published. And what kind of impact did that have? Doors open in the United States, yes. 
and around the world to Armenian refugees. There was humanitarian intervention. There was a political mandate for Armenia. There was an international treaty representing Armenian interests. And those news reports essentially became the first draft of history. So that equation, masses of newspaper coverage, justice, did that happen? No. The second big wave, it started in 1975 with the 60th commemoration, and it continued into the early 80s. TV documentaries like The Forgotten Genocide were broadcast on public television here in the United States. We also had news coverage of the shooting of Turkish diplomats, which fueled some of the media interest. But what really made the difference were protests. Protests by Armenian Americans who started to stand up as one unified group. Did we get justice in 1975 with all that media coverage? And media coverage equal justice? No. Attention? Well, our elected officials started to take into account their Armenian American constituents. Many of you will remember those times. Resolutions in local councils and state parliaments, legislation on genocide education in schools, Governor Reagan, then President Reagan, later calling it genocide in the 80s. That did not happen in a vacuum. The Armenian caucus in Congress, it all came from the Armenian protest movement, which did not lead to any change in America's policy towards Turkey. But it did get media attention. It did raise awareness. The new wave of media coverage, which we're still writing on, that new wave began in 2004. And it was fueled by Turkey's proposed membership of the European Union. We heard about Noam Chomsky talking about that last night. And suddenly, Turkey's human rights record, it became a focus in Europe. So they were talking about 2004. Samantha Power's Pulitzer Prize winning book, it focused attention on the Armenian genocide. Turkey prosecuting its own citizens, like the writer Orhan Pamuk. That was in the news in that period. That was before Hermann Dink. And then we had the rock band system of the down success around the world, and groups like the ANCA in America here using that success to reach a younger generation. Movies like My Own Screamers, which was produced by the BBC. Right in this wave in 2006, a resolution on the table in Congress on Armenian genocide recognition. And that, with the possibility of a general vote in Congress, all of that made the Armenian genocide newsworthy of the mainstream media. And so what happened? You saw 60 Minutes covering the Armenian genocide. Serge Tankian on major news networks, talking openly about the Armenian genocide, interviewed on Charlie Rose. Major editorials in mainstream newspapers, Armenian photos to be shown in the lobby of the United Nations, and then later blocked by Turkey. Features about the genocide, books about the genocide, media coverage, lots of it. Justice? No. Well, why? The root of the failure, of course, is the politics. It's been an inconvenient truth for America, who recognizes the genocide, yes, but doesn't want to push its ally, Turkey, to talk about it, to admit it. America has sided with Turkey, as we know, and enabled Turkey's denial. And in this model, speaking the truth about the Armenian genocide and supporting Turkey are seen to be mutually exclusive policies. You can't have both. That's the belief. Wrong, in my opinion, but entrenched. Justice, security, mutually exclusive. That policy is bipartisan and institutionalized in our State Department. And the main way of talking about it is not to talk about it at all. Silence is one of the hardest obstacles to overcome in media terms, in PR terms. Because when it comes to reporting on foreign policy, the media takes the lead from big politics, as we heard. By big politics, big politics, I mean the main political parties, local, state, federal politicians, the policy elite that surrounds them, the think tanks, the retired diplomats, the military, big politics. And if big politics isn't talking about Turkey, then there will be a vacuum in the mainstream public debate. Silence. Because as a general rule, news editors will follow big politics lead. 
Samantha Power argued that we need a very powerful domestic constituency to change a foreign policy, especially one perceived on national interest. America defines its policy towards Turkey as one based on national interest. So to change this calculus, Power says, we need a powerful group of citizens to push hard. There was no powerful constituency for Rwanda. No people pushing here for American intervention in the Rwandan genocide. No powerful constituency for the Cambodian genocide. No people pushing here for action. No protests, no discussion, no media coverage, no pressure. So America did not intervene. Well, we Armenians now, we're a domestic constituency in America. Can we get America talking? Well, editors decide day in, day out what resources they will devote to which stories. There isn't a cabal, a politburo, a bunch of guys in a smoky room saying, thou shalt not report the Armenian genocide, ever. They're looking at what they think is news and what will interest their audiences, as we've heard. Our issue is seen as peripheral, and even more peripheral if no one is talking about it. So big politics gets precedence. But as we've seen with that elevator video I was talking about earlier, even if big politics isn't talking about an issue, the media can still use its discretion in reporting on the issue. For example, protests, especially big ones. That gets media coverage. But there's still no guarantee. Editors will ask, how big are the numbers? Who's marching? Is this a political issue, a community issue, a religious issue? Are there survivors we can quote? Is George Clooney here? <laughs> Kim Kardashian? Is there anyone we can quote other than the small, pesky group of Albanians? Oops. I mean Armenians. <laughs> you may think. Controversy and opinion is what drives the mainstream media. For example, those columns in the newspapers we call op-eds, op-eds, the editorial pages that are opposite the editorials, the opinion pages. Certainly the Turkish lobby has influence with surrogates to write columns in the mainstream newspapers, sure. But you could just as easily argue those columnists are reflecting the State Department paradigm. The Turkish lobby, in my opinion, probably wishes it had a lot more influence than simply op-ed columns in the newspapers. What really drives the debate is not the opinion, it's the daily news coverage. And what drives that? The silence. No one talking, no one arguing, no one seeming to give a damn. And if they don't care, news editors wager, why should we? So if that's true, how did the Armenian genocide get so much coverage in the last wave? Well, I would argue we had a perfect storm, a combination of events, a new European issue, a Pulitzer Prize winning book, a world famous rock band, a commercially released movie, at the same time that the genocide resolution was being debated in Congress. It wasn't an Armenian genocide story. It was a music story, a film story, a book story, a European Union story, a Vanity Fair story about Dennis Hastert. <clears throat> a congressional story. A UN story about the new Secretary General blocking a photo exhibition in the UN lobby. Those stories were not based on any one decision about covering the Armenian genocide. But take another inconvenient truth, Darfur. Our government did not want to intervene in Sudan in Darfur. It didn't want to talk about it. Should they have intervened? Should we have intervened? Yes, to stop a genocide, but we didn't want to. And so there was silence. And because there were very few pictures about Darfur, that silence was easy to maintain. The government did not want to talk about this inconvenient truth. But George Clooney did. George was going to talk about Darfur, travel to Darfur, spend his money on helicopters and satellites in Darfur. All of that gave the reason, the media, a reason, an occasion to talk about Darfur when big politics didn't want to talk about it. Now, there were human rights groups, sure. Human rights, her human rights groups were talking about Darfur. 
but they couldn't get the same level of attention. They're considered to be on the periphery of big politics, not the center. Like us, Armenians, they're considered to be biased interest groups. But Clooney, ooh, that's another issue. Should celebrities decide what's in the news? If the alternative is silence, who's to say? This man single-handedly put Darfur on the world's media agenda, the world's agenda, when before it was an inconvenient truth. For Rwanda, Rwanda, no luck. President Clinton didn't want to talk about it. Very few media resources. Silence. The movie Hotel Rwanda did more to raise awareness about Rwanda than anything else. But guess what? That came 10 years later. <coughs> Too late to make a difference, to save lives. Now, the media does go outside big politics using their discretion, as we've seen issues like gun control, domestic violence, gay marriage, once considered locked in concrete, those issues have received massive amounts of news coverage, none of which originated in Washington. But let's just say um, Armenians got lucky, and we got that, that discretionary media coverage, circumventing big politics. You know there are still problems. One, when the issue is based on a news event, like an elevator video, or God forbid, a school shooting, those kinds of events are impossible to predict. If, though, if an event is based on celebrity, that's very hard to count on and may even backfire. If the coverage is based on popular culture, well, if it's popular culture, you have to create that. You have to write a book, make a movie, rock band tours, money. If a story is based on popular protest, the protest needs to be sustained or the coverage will stop. And it's usually much easier for an interest group to influence domestic interests, domestic issues rather than foreign policy, which usually has a bipartisan consensus, like the one we have for Turkey. And if all of that isn't challenging enough, there's the dirty politics that we've occasionally become victims of. When politicians are forced to speak about an inconvenient truth, especially on April the 24th, they may resort to dirty tactics, which then get repeated and circulated in the mass media. They will try to create fog. On the Armenian Genocide, they'll say it happened a long time ago. It's not relevant. They'll say it's a conflict between two parties. He said, she said. Let them work it out. They'll say it's a contested history. Politicians <coughs> shouldn't get involved. Leave it to the historians. They'll say it's a question of balance, as if there are two sides to a genocide, as if you can balance the truth, as if you would ask the Jews and the Germans to discuss whether the Holocaust happened? They'll never mention the America's record, Ambassador Morgenthau, Consul Davis, keep America out of it. They'll never mention European and American eyewitnesses, try to make it all about what Armenians say. And they'll use national interest as a reason to ignore this issue. Talking about this will hurt America. And they'll never say it's a crime, and certainly not crime of humanity. All of these are classic attempts to obscure and deny the historical record. Offensive, but they work. They play on ignorance and a misguided sense of patriotism. This Armenian genocide business is bad for America. The good news is these tactics don't always work. We have a stronger voice. Universities have chairs. Genocide scholars who are not Armenian regularly discuss the genocide. That said, for every newspaper that gets it right and calls it genocide, we've had reporters on the same publication fall backwards, calling it a disputed conflict. We may win these crucial battles, but we must still be prepared to hold the line. In conclusion, here's my four-point recipe for 2015, for what it's worth. One, we recognize those dirty tricks, but we refuse to engage in them. There is no balance in talking about genocide. It's not what Armenians say. It's what in the, in the historical record. We Armenians do not need to prove anything. Two, we widen our message. We recognize that media coverage of the Armenian genocide has been most successful when there's been another way to frame the issue. Books, 
movies, music, other genocides like Rwanda. Rwanda is about us. Darfur is about us. The Holocaust is about us. Genocide education, it's about us. American humanitarian intervention anywhere in the world, that's about us. Quote, I quote, I respect the fact that Armenians protest every year, unquote. Who said that? Steven Spielberg. Four, we educate. When the Armenian genocide does get reported, students have to be able to follow up and learn about it in school that same day. That same day. There must be easily available educational component to our message. Books, visual materials, testimonies. You know how hard we fought for those state mandates to teach Armenian genocide in schools here in America? We fought hard. But the teaching materials, they have to be there. That's why I've spent the last three years working on a digital archive, which makes Armenian genocide testimonies to universities and schools available around the world. If you see the genocide even mentioned on TV, you have to be able to learn about it in school. The two have to go hand in hand. So in conclusion, that equation of big media, big media will lead to justice, well, maybe that's an outdated way of looking at our challenge. In the digital age, newspapers and television still matter. Sure they do. But it's the direct access to primary sources which matters as much. Entire archives of diplomatic correspondence are now available for all to see. Entire archives. How we manage that, how we influence that, that's how we change the discussion. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying we lower our expectations. I say we widen them. On Ancestry.com, people right now, as we speak, as we're sitting here, some of them are grandparents even, are trawling through archives looking for evidence of their ancestry. 100-year-old documents. People are now fascinated by history. We need to expand our vision of what is mass communication. America's record on the Armenian Genocide is in archives which are being digitized. The genocide is documented in the world's archives which are being digitized. That historical truth, that record, it doesn't require me or you or the New York Times to persuade anyone. That's a historic truth, not an inconvenient truth. A truth that can't be rewritten or revised that's for everyone, even Turkish citizens, to see for themselves. In 2011, I'm doing this show named Gamuch, Village in Armenia. And it's the only and one uh, TV show broadcasted on Turkish satellite and now in cable TV uh, that you're able to speak Armenian with subtitles every week at least. Uh, this, this week, for example, we had an interview with Ron Gags in English, but it got subtitled originally. And it's the only uh, TV show who co uh, covers uh, minority issues in Turkey. Uh, since I began this uh, show, every month, uh, with the help of my friends uh, who are working there, uh, we went out the streets in the Arab Ahmed in Turkey. Uh, Ankara, Istanbul, wherever we, we have correspondents, we get out of the streets and ask questions, like a survey. What do you think about genocide? What happened in 1915? So the video that I want to show, which is done uh, two days before, for next week's show, and again we were asking, okay, what happened? Because uh, it depends on the wave that in Turkey, uh, what happened and how it changed people's minds. It's, it has been three years that I've been in this show, and uh, the only time that I get some answers is that, yeah, we know what happened in 1915 in, in streets. In their church, church. Uh, it was just after this year uh, when uh, Erdogan, uh, now president, uh, Erdogan was uh, de declared on 23rd uh, April uh, this letter on the internet, uh, not even uh, speech. Uh, that I get the answer, yeah, we know what happened in 1950. We didn't do anything. That was the only answer, which is close to uh, the organizer, uh, remember. Uh, now we have 
over 300 people uh, if the, uh, that we have in this interviews. So why I am telling this story because I wanted to start uh, what media in Turkey reports and how it affects on public. Because we see that, okay, we're always talking also in Europe when I go there in Armenia, yeah, the coverage, like Kara said, uh, the coverage, how, many, how much coverage do we have in Turkey about Armenian genocide, about Armenians, but also it, it's, it depends on the quantity and the quality of the, uh, of the knowledge and the, uh, of the coverage. Yeah, there are so many people, colonists in Turkey, uh, writing about this. So many Turkish uh, presenters on TV shows talking about this. But as I see in public, uh, as I see in the streets, it doesn't make that much difference. As we have the coverage in here also, we, we have this photo uh, in here, uh, there will be maybe more people in there, in Haidar Pasha, uh, on 24th April. I think this is last year or the year before. Uh, but how they decide, for example, this 24 April 2014, uh, the, uh, we were expecting that, okay, uh, people were, uh, news channels are going to broadcast live from Taksim, Taksim Square Memorial. Uh, but actually, there were not that much coverage. The coverage is more about what Erdogan said and uh, the day after, what uh, Mr. Foreign Affairs Davutoglu uh, that time uh, uh, was telling about this. Actually, what I'm going to tell, because I'm an academician, I'm not, uh, I, I have researchers, but I have my own experience for the last 15 years in, uh, in, in Turkey and in Armenia to watch this process, to observe this process, how it changed. Ten years before, when I went to Mardin, I wasn't able to get it, even a hotel room because I was Armenian, because of my name. Now, that guy is offering free hotel rooms to Armenians. <laughs> that, what it changed, this changed, maybe. But there is a lack of knowledge in, uh, in workers, in media workers in Turkey, that I want to give some examples for that, uh, because this is so important. Uh, in 2007, after the murder, uh, of Grant, like Obama Grant, we always call him like that in journal. Uh, there was a wave, and after there was a wave of coverage, and also when uh, Grant Foundation started the, in 2008, we started a program, journalism, a journalist exchange program between Turkey and Armenia. We took some journalists from Turkey to Armenia, Armenia to Turkey. Uh, because also there was this football games, stuff, we traveled a lot. And what I learned from that first 10 journalists that I took to Armenia, they were really senior journalists in Turkish media, very good places now. Uh, they're now news, uh, news directors in Turkish media, uh, they have their own TV shows in mass media, uh, on, on TVs. The names that when you searched, when I came back from Armenia, it was the first touch for them. They had a lack of knowledge in Turkey that they didn't know anything about Armenians, but they were forced to report about it because of their editors, because they wanted to make them to report something. When we were in Armenia that time, every day they were asking me, okay, what can I report today? Okay, you're in Armenia, go do your job. This is journalism. <laughs> I, I'm not going to make a PR of the country. The thing is, after five years, when we come back, uh, the senior journalists became these positions, news directors, they have their own TV shows. I get a call uh, from one of them, who was the news director of uh, one of the mass media, very well known, over uh, 200,000 copies selling daily. Call me that, okay, I'm sorry, tomorrow I'm going to publish a news in the headline. I know it's wrong, but they want me to publish it, I'm sorry. Uh, another agency, the official agency, uh, they were the news. The news was this. There was a killing. Uh, we never had named girl killed by Jem Beribol, a guy, and after that with the help of uh, his family, and the guy lost. The government was looking in red bulletin and everywhere, in Russia, every day. And for Four months it takes for coverages on uh, journals, 
the only thing that we were talking about that, okay, how they killed the girl, what happened, and everything. But Ekron was coming. It was February, I think. And the report was this. Jem Garibolu arrested in the border of Russia and Armenia. So this was just targeting Armenia and Armenians, that there was a mass murder in, in there in the country, and the killer was an Armenian. And the report was saying, Armenia is going, not going to return Jem Garibolu because we don't have relations, diplomatic relations with them, and they don't want to give it. And with the name using Mr. Foyne Affairs of Armenia, they were telling that, okay, it's not possible to get a criminal from Armenia uh, who ran for Armenia. First, lack of knowledge. There is no border between Russia and Armenia. <laughs> <laughs> Second, the guy wasn't in there. The guy was somewhere else. Also. Third, I called the Mr. Foyne Affairs. Okay, I said, uh, Tikram Balayan is now in there. Okay, did you give this kind of stuff to Turkish media? Did they call? Yes, someone called, but we were talking Armenian, so I don't think that they understood what they're saying. <laughs> <laughs> that this is fun also, that uh, Turkish media is calling and they're talking Armenian. That's another stuff uh, to talk about Armenia. Uh, this is, yeah, we're nothing, but this is so pretty. That news creates, a couple of years later, the meeting of Hojali in Istanbul to make that much crowded. This was the steps of it. Uh, and this kind of lack of knowledge are just served in Turkey. And just imagine, this person who did the news in that journal was the person who did the news about Sabiha Gökçen, about Granting. And that girl was with me in Armenia and reported, and she's working in the Wall Street Journal now. Uh, and she's really senior journalist, and she regrets that news that she did about Sabia Gök Channel, so that she prepared them, uh, like say, do the PR to the European Journal. But she still continues doing this, like, as I said, in Cem Garibol. She called me to say, I'm sorry, but I'm doing it. So this is also giving me a little uh, thing, which is, what is the interest in Turkey? Of course, like all the journals in the world, and media channels, uh, that the interest, what audience wants to see, it's always good to see, uh, to happen bad things to people, this is a good PR for them, to issues in the third pages, they're using it, okay, they're, this is, but also, mass media and others, uh, I can say that there, there's an investment. It's an investment. It's business for us. What makes money? Let's like, write about it. I will tell another experience to, uh, to make it clear. I'm giving this much to just give some data like videos. When we were, after 2007, we had big um, support from public in Turkey. Like, Hundred thousand, thousands of people walking, uh, saying that all of us around, all of us Armenian, we are all Armenians, we are all Kurds. I don't know where they are now uh, during the trials. Uh, they're so lowered, low, uh, low numbered. But that time, with so much support from all journals, Turkish, Kurdish, uh, everyone came to support us to work. Two things: we didn't have a responsible redactor in chief that time. The thing is, what does it mean in Turkey? You are responsible for everything. All the charges that the government was doing for Grant was going to come to the guy who was going to be the responsible redactor in chief. And you have a uh, chief editor also. We went uh, with a group of uh, intellectuals in Turkey. We went to Elif Shafak for Hamdanu. This was just creating lobby uh, for, okay, if their names were on the paper, we, thought we were thinking that, okay, no one is going to be able to open case after that much stuff. They rejected. They didn't want it to become responsible for that in chief in an Armenian paper. So what happened? I become uh, redacted in chief, and I went to the courts. The thing is, that days also uh, there was also supporting like people were trying to give advertisements to support uh, to invest on the journal because it 
That's it. We went to one of the big companies in Turkey. Uh, I'm going to give the name, I don't uh, have a hesitate for that, it's Sabancı. They, because they were close to a living community. And they said, okay, we want to advertise on the newspaper, Agos, to actually want to invest on that. But let us do the process and give, give us the, uh, your applications and other stuff. After three months, we get this, uh, we get this answer. Uh, saying that, okay, we can't advertise on you, we can't pay, but please don't put the advertisement. <laughs> okay, we said, what's happening? Uh, they said, okay, we had a survey in our clients. Most of our clients, 65% uh, of, uh, of our car selling company, let's say, uh, nationalist Turks. So if we advertise on you, we are going to lose them. Uh, we are frightened to lose them. And we don't have, we want to have any risks about it. So just let us help you, but uh, don't put the advertisement. But the idea was putting the advertisement of a Turkish company in an Armenian paper. That was the thing. Because uh, in 1915, before 1915, all the advertisements in Turkey first was going to Jamanak paper. It was delivered all over Ottoman. And it was everything. If a French company wanted to uh, there was something in Turkey, they were sending the advertisement first Jamaic uh, newspaper. <coughs> These experiences give me that gave me that idea that okay, what's changing that? What are we doing there? Why are we talking? Why are we writing? What are we doing there? Then I start to look back from today, as I said from the last to the uh, beginning. Uh, I started to work about 1965 that I, we prepared an analyzed book, uh, let's say media monitoring book last year with Sardar Kuluju from CNN. Uh, we just uh, scanned the papers in Turkey, what happened in 1965. It was the first time Turkey dealt with diaspora. It was the first time 65, all diaspora, Lebanon, Middle Eastern, US, everywhere there were demonstrations against Armenia, against Turkey, about genocide. In 65, Turkey had the same, used the same sentences, used the same way, uh, what I'm telling you now, uh, what happened in the last five years. Then we started to go back, okay, what happened in 1950 then? It was the same. Same, I mean, it's so interesting. Every time this issue comes up, there is an Armenian family in Turkey who, who wants to be convert to Islam uh, at the second day. In the, in the 26th of, uh, 26th of uh, April in 1965, uh, there is a Tokat family, uh, uh, the Armenian family in Tokat wants to convert to Islam. Same happens in 75. It's one, it's in Yozgat, uh, the 75. And 80, 80 maybe the free government, you know. Every time this issue comes up, in 2007, after the murder, I see another paper, and I wrote that. This time it's, it was in my hand. I wrote about it. There is a paper in Batman, wrote that, okay, the last Armenian in Batman, uh, it's in February 2007. Uh, there is an Armenian, the last Armenian in Batman converted Islam before he, he dies. <laughs> okay, I called because the guy, uh, surname, I know Demirji, uh, it's a very famous family in there. I called Demirji family, okay, I said, okay, how? He was in there and we didn't know uh, that why I didn't interview. He was living in Sweden, his family was moved in Sweden. He was coming back to the village for summer and he died in there. And there was a, a woman in, in, uh, in Batman uh, next to him, which Later, I understood that she was converted. Uh, she was coming from a converted family. Uh, when she, when he died, she was in there, and she didn't know who to call. Uh, she called the imam. Then, when the imam came, oh, uh, she, he, the guy said, "Okay, he's dead. Uh, let's do the funeral." And they did the funeral. So this is how he became converted to Islam in 2007. I can count you like dozens of experience like this. The, and still, Turkish media is trying to claim that they, will, they want freedom of speech. 
clear what. Uh, I'm not saying for the columnists, I'm not saying especially for people, but they don't want it. If they wanted it, they were going to do it. Two years before, one of these mass media uh, journals wanted to, they, they, they get a grant uh, from somewhere to do the freedom of speech tour with a train in Turkey. And they want to put their coverages for the last 50 years on the train. They wanted to show them, okay, we did this, we did this, we did this report, it's good, it's good. News editor called me and said, okay, we, we couldn't find anything about our news. Can you give some to me? Okay, what, what should I do about uh, freedom of speech uh, and Armenians to you? You're going to publish this week and put next week on the train. That to say that I already covered this. And come on, let, look at look back. For 50 years you did you look to your archives and you didn't find anything to put on, on that train that you were supporting, you wanted freedom of speech. That's the thing. And also uh, that's it's, it, it's crazy to see uh, this lack of knowledge, but it's crazy also to see that people want this to continue because they don't like it. What's, going to, what's happening now in Turkey is covering uh, genocide issues in columns, but in the news, for example, and that's interesting. Every year uh, during 24 April, Still, journals and media are looking for some Armenians to uh, interview in Turkey. We are not so much to talk. Maybe talk uh, or writing about it, five, ten people I can count, uh, interviewing about, uh, about uh, genocide, but not using the G word sometimes. So they're asking you to, okay, they're interviewing you, but you don't know what they're going to publish. The thing is, some of them, more, uh, more Islamic ones, are especially, for example, when they're asking articles for me, especially asking me to write Western Armenia, especially, uh, can you imagine what point we can? And can you imagine, I'm thinking that, okay, how they're going to use this in the future, why they're asking me to write this like this, like they wanted. And this makes me thinking more about what's going to happen next, in 2015, which I'm not very, hopeful for Turkey, that, that I know that, okay, for Taksim, uh, they get uh, the permission to make the memorial in there, or in there, uh, it's going to be organized, but still there is a big, big lack of knowledge in public because this media is reporting this. Yeah, and for them, uh, it's more important to interview with you and or take you every 24 April, 20 April, April. April is the time. Or now we have another day, 19th of January. Talk about Grant, talk about Grant, talk about Grant. Okay, I wrote this. I wrote thousands of this. There are books, there are documentaries. Please let's move forward. They don't want it. Moving forward for them is now uh, talking about, okay, uh, let's not talk about the past, what is going to happen next. This is what, what they want from me. But also, uh, this knowledge is, kept, is coming from their past. Imagine these all editors are grew up in Turkish uh, national system. They don't know what uh, they don't know what is Armenian. They don't know what is Armenian. Come on, the thing, Turkish uh, radio television officially when they wanted to go to Armenia to broadcast from there, it was 2009. They asked me to go, how to, how to go. I said, okay, you're a state company, but yeah, there's no diplomatic relations. Uh, but they were frightened to go to Armenia. The workers, the producers were asking me, are they going to kill us when, they, when we go there? <laughs> should, 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 should I take a bodyguard with me, Turkish bodyguard? And I was just saying, okay, let's go guys, just come with me. Uh, I couldn't convince them to fly to Armenia directly. I convinced them to fly over to the sea, first Georgia. We went to Georgia, then to Armenia. Everything was great in there. Everyone, all the doors were open for TRT because for Armenia at that time, they wanted to uh, talk with them. They wanted to say whatever they want. But the report never published and broadcasted in TRT. 
that report that issued for 15 days. Uh, they interviewed with Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Even this is not published. Can you imagine? Yeah. Uh, good or bad, uh, it's it's news. Uh, it's not uh, it's not published, broadcasted. But what I had in my uh, what stayed in my mind that they were really good in Armenia, but when they came to back, that producers uh, was telling me that it was terrible. And I was thinking, saying, okay, what is terrible? What happened in their terrible? You you know Aram Khachadurian, they were calling that Aram Khachadurian. Yeah, I know Aram Khachadurian is very famous. Yeah, it's the Arabic guy, it's Arab Khachadurian. Come on, can you imagine how this lower how the level is low and this producing group and the person is still doing documentaries or TRT documentary uh, about nationalism about c come on this is this is the level that I see in there of course there's another level that we have to talk with them we have to uh, we, 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 we have to more uh, writing about it but today is this Final conclusion, last sentence maybe. What was going to happen in 2015? 2015, we're going to see more coverages about Gelikoli, Anzacs, in Turkey. Erdogan even made his speech during uh, during the elections, before the elections, and he said it's going to be a specific date in Gelikoli, uh, Gelikoli to uh, Çanakkale in Turkish, uh, that uh, they're going to move in there, and they're planning to make a big monument in there. Uh, and more about Anzacs, and they even had, uh, they're going to even have the uh, president of uh, Australia, they even get in touch, and we're not going to be able to see that uh, more, and we're going to see Azerbaijan-Armenia relations more in Turkey, they're going to work on that in media uh, very much. They started from now, and Azeri lobby is going to also uh, follow this in 2015. So, as Carlos said, more coverages I don't think is going to give some more uh, knowledge to people in Turkey. I don't think it's going to happen on media, not yet. But let's be hopeful. 2015 is not a critical day for me. This is the, the it's, it's long lasting uh, movement that we're doing it. We stay 100 years, we're going to stay more. Uh, so because of that, let's move let's forward to what we're going to do after 2015. Thanks. No, this isn't a question, but I feel, given the form in the moment, I'd like to, in a way, respond to Carla's presentation. And, and, and Carla, I mean this only in a historical sense here, because I think there's a piece of narrative that's missing in what you've, you've noted, although what you've noted is important. And because, you know, we're in part of gathering scholars here, I want, I want to kind of note this in a certain form. Um, I think if you look at the change in coverage on the Armenian genocide in the mainstream press, the critical moment is 1995-96. And I'm going to apologize for me being in the narrative, but that's simply you know, the way it is. Robert Lifton and I began a, a national petition drive that responded to the Heath Lowry Princeton University scandal. And through that drive, you know, we, we accumulated about 200 signatures from prominent academics and public intellectuals. And so all of a sudden, this petition, this, this collective statement of scholars and intellectuals appeared. Mailer, Sontag, Vonnegut, Skip Gates, Cornell West, Robert Bell, and a whole group of really fascinating, important minds. Within six months, we were on the front page of the New York Times, the LA Times, the Boston Globe, and the Chronicle of Higher Education. 
And the Armenian genocide was now being conceptualized as a problem. It wasn't just a footnote, a struggle, a debate. The word denial was in the headlines, and something had happened different. And it had happened because scholars and intellectuals had come together. The next key moment was 1999 at the International Association of Genocide Scholars, when Roger Smith and myself, Bob Nelson, Israel Charney and a few others put together a resolution about the discourse definition and history of historiography on this history. That text led to three other IAGS texts over the next four or five years. And I can tell you that when I got a call from Chris Smith, the congressman uh, from New Jersey, who was heading the Foreign Relations Committee, that was being bombarded by Turkish pressure in 2007. He said to me, the, the bottom line for all of us in telling Turkey to get out, and he said, we were so turned off by these people. They had made such fools of themselves, and it was the IAGS letter that was it, because it represented a collective intellectual assessment of the discourse and the historiography. The next key moment, as I can see it, was Samantha Power and myself and Bob Nelson going to meet with Bill Keller at the New York Times. Now, Bill was the new executive editor. We went in there thinking, oh boy, are we going to have a struggle? This is going to be a fight. This is going to be a debate. I would say in five minutes, Bill turned to all of us and said, look, guys, We've really been behind on this one, and we're sorry about it. He, took, he looked to me and he said, Peter, Al Siegel will call you Monday, and the two of you will arrange a new policy of coverage. And again, I, this is not about me. I'm just telling you what happened. When Al Siegel called me on Monday about the new coverage, I mean, really, I was almost feeling I was in a dream because we had worked so hard to get the times to do something proper on this. And, and then you saw in the next three, four years, Armenian genocide was headlined, I don't know, a half a dozen times, especially in 07 and 08 with her on things. But it was the genocide that was the rubric. So I think that the work of scholars has made a big difference. I'll, I'll note again, 2007, Ellie Diesel and I meet with the AP. And the APs had a huge impact on international coverage. It wasn't a hard conversation. I mean, Ellie's presence was, was a lot more important than mine. But the point is, intellectuals and scholars get in a conversation with properly documented historiography and discourse, and things can happen. And so I really, I want to add that to, to the no, next. I, I absolutely agree with that. Thank you for adding it. And I did not mean to, mean to leave that out. I would, I would add to what you just said about the, the International Association of Genocide Scholars. That it fa I think, now that I'm thinking about it now, I think it falls in the list of the organizations that nobody wants to talk about from the mainstream of big politics because, because it's very uncomfortable to mention the International Association of Genocide Scholars. So, so, so I find I'm constantly trying to bring it up. I'm trying to telling people about it. I'm sending them the letters that was written. I'm sending a reference to what you, you know, what that whole episode. And it's like it's like Armenians have to be the ones to keep reminding that this is the case. We have to educate people about it. But it's 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 like they're it's not they're not so much an interest group, but they're they're they shouldn't be considered peripheral. You would think international association generally they should not be peripheral, but there's a there's a tendency to marginalize them because they're not in the in that sort of inner world. Not, so I'm not I'm not in any way minimizing anything you say. I agree with everything you say, but I think that the for some reason the International Association of Genocide Scholars is still there's a tendency for media to marginalize them. It's wrong, but they but but they are being marginalized. But, and, but and we have to we have to keep the pressure up to not do it. Absolutely, but don't forget you know that somebody like Chris Smith is directing the. Committee on International Relations in Congress sees that letter as the settler. You know, and I think yeah, that yeah. needs to be, you know, I haven't talked, I, I haven't, it's something I've never really talked about because that's private stuff, but who cares, right? I mean, I've heard, I've heard from Congress, Senate over the years, 
because there's no ambiguity among any of them about the discourse record on this event. I'm going they, to have to conclude this um, because they, we are Yeah, OK, late. you bet. Sorry. So I'd like to give you I, I apologize. To I apologize. To OK, thank you. Yes. I guess I'd like to just follow on to that, because there is something very tangible which has come out of that whole process. Um, I don't know if other people are aware of this, but the New York Times has a topic summary of the Armenian Genocide, which is on their website. It was written by John Kiffner, and it is unbelievably useful because they state, that the, they state the facts of the genocide. They state that this was extensively covered in the paper. Um, it could not be any more sympathetic and positive. And that is a reference source from what is, many would argue, the national paper of record. So that is hugely useful, and I've leveraged that in a number of situations, and people should know about that being out there. John Kiffner is the person who wrote it, K-I-F-N-E-R. Democracy Now. 
uh, Armenian Genocide, Mom, nothing. Uh, or uh, other uh, progressive uh, websites, Politico, CommonDreams.com, etc., all down the line. Armenian Genocide, you don't see anything there. Uh, but it's read by, you know, influential people and future inf influential people. A lot of young people coming up through the system. So I think that there are things that we can do, and I think that we need to look at other avenues that we haven't necessarily explored yet. Um, this actually follows up really uh, maybe on what you were saying, Levon, and particularly this for uh, a question for Dr. Garbadian, um, but everyone maybe has something to say about this. And one of the things that I noticed in the discussion we've had, and particularly if this is true of coverage in Turkey, this discourse in Turkey, but I think it's also true much more broadly, is the Armenian genocide is presented in isolation as an issue. We want to get this issue on the table. And one of the things that's significant about the IAGS, the International Association of Genocide Scholars, is the Armenian genocide is contextualized within a very broad human history of genocide and human rights um, of violence and, and destruction. And I'm wondering what, where in the media is our way of sort of putting the Armenian genocide in that context, in, in, a, in a very long history of a, a lot of different cases. And of course, it's related to the Holocaust quite often. But beyond that, you mentioned you know the, the Darfur issue, and this is a, I mean, not only is the Turkish government you know has the Turkish government on record saying uh, uh, I think it was Erdogan who said this that Muslims don't commit genocide, therefore Al Bashir shouldn't be indicted and so forth. I mean there are there are really direct connections between these these histories, and I'm wondering how you see that. Is that a possibility of, of real change in the discourse? Well, I do think it is, and I think it's what started in the last wave, because Samantha Powers book made the connection between the genocide, starting with the Armenian genocide, and then working through the other ones. She created that template, and that started, uh, the, the ANCA as a lobby group decided to reach out and talk about Darfur amongst Armenian issues. System of a Down started to do it, and it started to become a little more, this is the thing you do, you talk about other genocides, I call it language. It's, uh, I've been working with the Shoah Foundation in the last three years. Armenian Film Foundation has uh, 400 digital uh, Armenian genocide testimonies, which we, we believe should be shared with the world, and they have a digital archive. We got a lot of flack in the beginning for working with the Shoah Foundation. Why, why are you working with the Shoah Foundation? So, well, because they're a genocide archive, and they're looking at all genocides not just the Holocaust. Now, Armenians have, have, Armenians have a problem with that because some Armenians, because they think our pain is very exclusive, unique to us, and we shouldn't be comparing to other genocides. So part of the blockage has been us. But once you, know, once you sort of talk about it and, and get that out, I think it's very important to look into human rights issues and other genocides. Very important because then you're not, you're not, you're, you're joining hands with lots of, you're joining hands in a universal message, and that's much more powerful. Very important. And I think, I think also, I mean, responding to the earlier question about, we do have people who regularly will get at newspapers who are getting it wrong, from the inside and the outside. And there's a kind of group of people. Carlos Sicilian's one of them. He will be on the, you know, He'll be on those editors so fast it's the LA Times and it's the Boston Globes. So there, there is vigilance within our community. It's often you don't hear about it, but there's the newspapers are that they will often complain. The most letters they get are from angry Armenians because of the way their you know stories have been uh, spun. So there there is some of that which 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 does help. And my message is that I don't think we should only be looking at newspapers and TV as the way we get our message out because there are these other ways that people are talking to each other. It's important, it's important, but it's not the only way. So, um, and also we have more journalists and filmmakers who are making, writing those stories and making those films, and, and we, have, we have had a ripple effect in ways you can't really know. You know, you might have met, I'm sure you've had this happen, the people you work with, you educate them, and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. But they, it has a, it has a multiplier effect. And I think the more people, you know, Armenians traditionally don't get their children into journalism or the media. It's not considered a necessarily a good, you know, way to, to have a have a balanced, happy life. Maybe <laughs> sort of a doctor or something, right? But but that said, the more of us who are out there, the more that we educate our colleagues and we also directly write some of those stories and, and make a difference. Yes, I have a question for Ice. 
I, um, what kind of impact is the movie uh, The Cut having in Turkey? I know that you were interviewed about that, um, not that long ago by Civilnet, but I'm, I'm interested if that will have any impact at all in Turkey. For, for the movie, let me uh, say, everyone thinks that I like the movie. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I, think the, I think I'm the only one who reported, who coming from Turkey, and reported about that in, a, in another way. Because as I, don't, I wrote my, uh, my, my feelings about it uh, when I'm watching it, the, the same way that I was watching Arada and Aviadis brothers. Uh, but the thing is, First, we have to uh, we have to uh, look beyond the film. Uh, I think what is it for? When it started? With which money? Producers are who? Uh, the thing if uh, if we the Armenians were trying going to uh, have a propaganda film in Turkey to be watched, to be uh, screened, I think it's a good way to start for that in my, in my mind. The thing is already the producers. Uh, Turkish Armenian uh, actors and actresses in, in in the film, they're just saying that this film is for Turkish people uh, done for Turkish people to watch it. Patiakin says it. I don't care about you Americans. I don't care about Germans if they're going to like it. Every sentence that I was writing, I was here. It's called. Uh, I was writing. I was thinking what Turkish. Uh, public, Turkish viewers, audience is going to think. And also, the screening in uh, was also showing something. The journalists who they interviewed, uh, a journalist who is who has very uh, support uh, and who has millions of Twitter followers, and a journalist who was in the US, I go there, and a journalist like me, Armenian, coming from a TV channel which is supported by Kurdish side. So you know this. You if you want to reach the public in Turkey, this is a good PR to do. Uh, it, the story about his father after that published. Uh, Fatih Akin has a nationalist Grey Wolf website. Uh, father, but it, it was just PR in there. Uh, it was obviously before the film they were decided who is going to give interview to who, and what was Akin was going to talk to me, why he was mentioning around to me, not to the others. Uh, these are all going to work uh, in Turkey, because I think uh, it's going to create, uh, because what, 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 the translation of what, uh, the interviews that he was giving me, and the translation of the news in Turkey that we are reading about the film, uh, that okay, the church, it, it, there is a good PR for the film uh, to make it viewed by tur uh, church public by saying that even nationalists liked it. Uh, even Turkish nationalist Ray Wolf watched it and said there is no, there is not going to hurt. Watch it. That uh, this is a game. It's going to hurt. It hurt me, and I saw people in there. It hurt. Uh, also, but is this the idea? Is this the main idea? For example, if you are doing a film like this, are you able to talk about dying for art? Is it this art or business? This is uh, what happened in Arad or what happened in the with Atoms and uh, Atomeguyan and Arsene Hajan, how they are explaining the film and the philosophy of what they were trying to do in there, and now putting in this is different. This is a Hollywood movie, what I can do. The, uh, for for Turkish public, and they're going to like it uh, because whatever they want, they like in Turkish movies. It's exactly in there. <laughs> they're going to, the, the killer turns into the saver. Saver. The, then he regrets. There is no voice of the uh, in the Armenians. They're they're, they're it's, come on. It's the, it's a silence. Yeah, so all, all irony in 400 years, it's in there. But he's saying this openly. I did it for it. He's saying this. So for this, uh, it's going to be on the screening on December, I think, uh, in Turkey. That's also a critical date. Before 2015, on December, you're putting on the screen this guy in this film. Uh, and it's going to create an impact. The thing, what I, what I really liked, uh, 
for what he was saying, okay? It's, at least it's honest. Uh, if people get up from the, this field and Google about Armenian genocide, that's, that's, that's something. I told you, for three years we are doing a TV show. Every week we are having minimum 30,000 uh, 30, uh, viewers on the show and 30,000, 50,000 viewers for the show. But still, I, didn't, I couldn't get the real answer that I wanted from the street. Even in the Kurdish areas, even here. We have to watch our language uh, in Turkey when we're, uh, we, we, we couldn't educate uh, for this, I can say that, about an issue like this, this much critical, talking to an Armenian. They can just say that, okay, your parents killed my parents too, whatever. That's not the issue. We, we can start from here. But this is what media is pumping. But I think in 2015 it's going to create a little uh, knowledge in Turkey. Uh, but of course, government is going to uh, use this in another way. Okay, I think we have maybe one more question, and then we started a little bit late, so we're going to have to close. Um, when we actually, sort of follows up on this. I wanted to let Mikhail get up and down for something about the cost. I haven't seen it yet. I'm looking forward to seeing it. And um, is it, did it play in the Berlin Film Festival this uh, last no. year? Is it coming up? No, uh, they, right. they're playing, uh, I think, Hamburg Film Festival. Oh, Hamburg, right.